we have been in the middle of a series on the book of Revelation, and it's been entitled, The Final Word. And hopefully, as we've journeyed uh, just a little bit into the first few chapters of Revelation, we're not going through the whole book, we're just dealing with uh, the first couple chapters where you have the greeting to the seven churches, uh, we've entitled it The Final Word. And hopefully, uh, through our time together and through the time that will come, you will maybe see Revelation with fresh eyes, or maybe see it with a little bit uh, different perspective, that yes, it's this book of incredible imagery and complex theology and fantastical you know, spiritual accounts, but it very deliberately, as we're attempting to point out, it very deliberately starts with with a greeting. It starts with a greeting to seven churches. And I think it's helpful for us because it's a reminder that though it is a complex book, though it is a hotly debated book, uh, though it is a book that has produced endless charts and diagrams and best-selling novels and all these things attempting to, to explain how exactly is the world going to end, that there's a bigger picture in mind. There's actually a present message for the here and now out of the book of Revelation. And so as the Apostle John writes it, and he has this greeting to the seven churches, it's a reminder that it's not just a vision of what's to come, but it's actually a vision for here and now. It's a vision for the church, that she's given this picture of an already but not yet victorious kingdom of Christ that is here in part, but will one day be here in fullness. And it uses all this fantastical and vivid imagery as a way to give us a vision that will overwhelm any hardships or trials or persecution that we might face in the present. It wants to sweep us off our feet with this grand vision of our Savior and the kingdom that he's bringing to bear. And so again, John the Apostle has been the mouthpiece that, that God uses in this book to encourage seven churches. Seven churches in the pressure cooker, which was first, late first century Roman Empire. And we've had a chance to look at two of the churches so far, and this morning we'll begin looking at the third church, which is the church of Pergamum. So if you have a Bible, I invite you to turn to Revelation chapter 2, I believe it will also be on the screens, but Revelation chapter 2, we'll begin reading in verse 12, and it says, to the angel of the church in Pergamum, write, the words of him who has the sharp two-edged sword. I know where you dwell, where Satan's throne is, yet you hold fast my name, and you did not deny my faith, even in the days of Antipas, my faithful witness, who was killed among you where Satan dwells. But I have a few things against you. You have some there who hold the teachings of Balaam, who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the sons of Israel that they might eat food sacrificed to idols and practice sexual immorality. So also you have some who hold the teaching of the Nicolaitans. Therefore repent. If not, I will come to you soon and war against them with the sword of my mouth. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who conquers, I will give some of the hidden manna, and I will give him a white stone with a new name written on the stone that no one knows except the one who receives it. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we are grateful that you are the God who speaks, that you are the God who has spoken. And so, Father, we're grateful that you would be gracious enough to speak through your word, that we would be blessed to be able to hold the scriptures in our very hands, to read of you, to read of your ways, to read of your greatness, your majesty, your power, but ultimately to also read of the story of our salvation, the story of our redemption, which is ours in the word who became flesh, Christ Jesus. And so, Father, we pray that as we have read this text, as we now think on it together, that we would indeed see Jesus, the Christ, the word who became flesh, that we would see him high and lifted up, 
that the words of this text and the words that we speak here together would ultimately overwhelm those voices that compete for our attention in the world. So Father, we thank you for your grace. We thank you for your mercy. We pray these things in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. When, uh, when products have become household names, you know they've done well. So for instance, if you're like me, I don't call soda usually by its proper name, whether I'm drinking Pepsi, Dr. Pepper, Coke, RC Cola, anybody still drink that, RC Cola? Not so much, right? Um, it's called all Coke. So my wife's running to Chick-fil-A real quick to grab dinner for the kids, right? And for myself, kind of like a big kid, right? Um, I'll have a number one with a Coke. Now they actually serve Coke, but you know, if it was Pepsi, it wouldn't matter. Number one with a Coke. Coke's done well. Brand name, product name. Uh, in your workplace, you have copy machines, right? Well, Xerox corners the market. Hey, can you Xerox this for me real quick? Even if it's a Toshiba or an IBM, it doesn't matter, right? Xerox is the name brand. If you get choked up in a movie, you know, hey honey, can you run and grab the Kleenex for me? Okay? Doesn't matter if it's a generic bathroom facial tissue, all right? It's Kleenex, okay? That's the name. That's what we call it. I need a Kleenex. Wipe my nose, whatever, okay? You've done well if you've gotten to that point. Well, the same thing has actually happened in basketball, whether you realize it or not. There's something known as the Princeton offense. The Princeton offense is kind of the phrase that we use to talk about any team that runs an offense where the backdoor cut, it's called, is readily available, or it's a featured part of their offense. The backdoor cut, meaning the area closest to the basket, kind of either on the way or underneath the hoop, all right, where someone's open and someone can make a pass and get an easy layup, an easy score. If you run that and you run backdoor cuts in your offense, you go, oh, they're running the Princeton offense. That's kind of the, the name. And it gets its name from, of all places, Princeton University. Um, in the 60s to the 90s, about 30 year period, they had one coach and he orchestrated what's now known as the Princeton offense. And the genius of the Princeton offense is that while most defense, most conventional defense, uh, works hard to guard the man with the ball, who's at the top, okay, by the three-point line, bringing the ball down, you guard that man vigilantly. All, right, all your attention is focused on the person at the top with the ball. Well, the Princeton offense features all five players, doesn't matter if they have the ball or not, all five players are moving in harmony, moving in sync, moving in rhythm. Pass, 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 move, 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 until finally the defense is discombobulated and that back door cut is open. And you can make an easy bounce pass, whatever, and hopefully get an easy layup. It's been duplicated elsewhere. Other schools now run it. It's even been featured in the NBA and professional basketball at times, but the Princeton offense has done well. And it's predicated on a defense, not just securing the front door, but the back door. The back door as well. And it's enabled less athletic teams or whatever um, to have great success. Princeton doesn't give athletic scholarships. You give academic scholarships. And over those 30 years, they won about 500 basketball games. A couple NCAA tournament appearances. They did very, very well. But again, it's predicated on not just guarding the front door, but the back door also. If you can hold that image in your mind, if you can think of that concept as we talk more this morning, then you're halfway home to understanding this passage. You're halfway home. So what do I mean? Well, the church. The church at Pergamum. See, Pergamum was the city about 15 miles inland from the Aegean Sea in what is now like present day Turkey. And it was most likely a church that was founded probably out of the church of Ephesus. So we know the Apostle Paul, he starts the church in Ephesus. It does quite well. They evangelize the known area and likely just a little bit of speculation, likely produced eventually the church in Pergamum. 
all right? But Pergamum is this city that becomes kind of the administrative capital of what was the Asian province of the Roman Empire. And they're known for having this library, all right, that's second to none, only except for the, the library in Alexandria. Alexandria, Egypt, all right? In fact, there's a little legend, right? Everybody loves library legends, and they sound very exciting. But uh, there's a little legend where um, Pergamum is building their library, and they want to hire away the librarian from Alexandria, okay? So, you know, throw some extra money his way, extra books, you know, maybe a corporate card, corporate vehicle, an expense account, you know, whatever. They want to hire him away. He refuses, but Alexandria finds out about it. They get very mad, and they stop exporting papyrus to the city of Pergamum which is like the reeds that they built books out of, scrolls back then. And so Pergamum has to start using parchment, animal skins, dried animal skins, which is already used elsewhere, but now Pergamum uses it exclusively. All right? And so a lot of people think the name Pergamum is a derivative from the original word for parchment. All right? So it's this city, administrative capital, has a library, pretty impressive. But beyond that, like most Greco-Roman cities, it also features countless temples. Temples to every known god and goddesses. Uh, in fact, back then, you know, religion is kind of a smorgasbord. The more gods, the better. The more, the merrier. You burn incense to this one, to that one. The more gods in your city, the better. So temples to various gods are everywhere. But like the church we looked at with Rob last week, like the church in Smyrna, which had a temple to the emperor cult, that was also true of Pergamum. It has a temple to the emperor cult. And you see, that's a problem for Christians. It's a big problem. Because while those who ran the temple of Zeus or Athena or Dionysius or whoever it might be might think Christians are weird and Christians are rude for not stopping by, you know, the temple orgies, for not visiting the shrine prostitutes, for not coming to the sacrificial festival, Christians might be rude and uncultured for not doing that, but there's really no offense taken. They have their own God, fine. It's one of many, fine. Do what you want. But the emperor cult is different. The emperor cult is very different because the Roman Empire is vast. Many territories, many people groups, huge borders. And so the emperor cult is an attempt to unite the empire. All kinds of peoples, all kinds of countries, unite them in worship of Caesar. Unite them in worship of the emperor. And here's the problem, though. For everybody else, not a big deal. You bow to Zeus, you bow to Athena, you bow to Dionysius. On the way home, you tip the cap to this god and that god, and you bow to Caesar, and you make your way home, no problem. But it's different for Christians. It's different for Christians. Christians will bow the knee to no one but Christ Jesus. And so what happens is there's great persecution, there's great hardship, and they're threatened from every side, which is why if you look in our text together, if you look at verse 13, John, or Jesus through John, mentions Antipas, this person who likely was martyred for their faith. They were faithful, they refused to bow down, and they lost their life because of it. So this is the climate in which they live. This is the climate of that city. Persecution from every side. But what does Jesus also say? If you go back a verse ahead, the words of him who has the sharp two-edged sword. You see, Christ reminds his church that though the government and the empires of this world can persecute, can bear the sword, there's one who stands above them who has the sharp two-edged sword, the sword of his mouth. And it's his justice, and it's his priorities, and it's his kingdom which will one day rule over all. And so he's writing to encourage them. And so he encourages them, Jesus, through John, encourages this church about their faithfulness. They've held fast his name. They have not denied the faith. They've been faithful witnesses. But, look at verse 14, but, I have this against you. 
And it's as if, it's as if Jesus is saying, kind of like the Princeton offense, hey, Pergamum, you've done well. You've done well. You've guarded the front door. But stay on your guard. Stay on your guard. Why? Because they may have continued to confess Christ as Lord. They may have continued to recognize no other gods but Jesus. They have refused to bow the knee to Caesar. But his question, and it's a very pertinent question for us as well, his question is, yes, but is your church, is your confession, is a relationship with me corporately, with me personally, is it susceptible in other ways? Is it susceptible to being undermined in other ways? The front door is secure, but is the back door wide open? And is it susceptible? You see, Jesus understands that the adversary, the devil, he's not a one-trick pony. He's got many things up his sleeve. He's got many tools in the toolbox. And so if he can't move us from our belief in Jesus, if he can't move us off of our proper theology and our proper doctrine, then he will seek to undermine us other ways. You see, if he can't, in other words, if he can't move us from belief in Jesus to belief in many gods, you know, all religions the same, to then maybe outright atheism, where we deny Jesus just carte blanche. If he can't do that, if he can't get us from the top down, how is he gonna work, the enemy? He's gonna work from the bottom up. He's gonna seek to break in through the back door. And he'll work to destroy us through our devices, our appetites, our habits, the things that can undermine our confession that way. If he can't get us to bow the knee to another God, he will seek to derail our affections. He will seek to derail our priorities. He will seek to derail our habits to the point that what happens, subtly but surely, what do we do? We begin to develop a theology. We begin to develop a confession that justifies our behaviors. We begin to develop a theology or a confession that suits our lifestyle. And so we begin to hack away at scripture. We begin to hack away at the gospel claims in order to create this sort of deviant confession. He wants them to be aware of that. And he wants them to realize that the adversary will work in that way so that we may never formally deny Christ. We may never formally deny the gospel, but we will functionally will functionally deny his lordship over every area of our lives. And that's why if you continue reading, look at verse 14. This is why John references, or Jesus through John, references um, Balaam, the story of Balaam in the Old Testament. You have Balaam and you have Balak. And if you notice, he references them both here. You see, Balak was the king of Moab. It's a neighboring kind of people group to Israel. And as Israel's journeying through, uh, he gets very nervous. And so King Balak, he hires Balaam, who's this sort of mercenary prophet, like a prophet for hire. And he brings him in and he says, you need to curse God's people. And he throws money at him and, and possessions at him and everything. And Balaam literally can't. God prevents him from doing so. And he will not curse God's people. In fact, he actually calls a judgment down upon Moab instead. All right? But it's too late. You can't get a refund for the prophecy at that point. It's too late. And so Balaam, though, goes away. And it's as if though he has this like, twinge of conscience where he goes, King Balak paid me quite handsomely. Okay? He paid me quite handsomely. I got to at least throw the guy a bone. So he goes back and he basically says, look, look, Balak, you're way overthinking this. You're making this way too complicated. You don't need me, a professional prophet, to call down judgment upon God's people. Why don't you just send some of the women from your country their way, all right? And before you know it, they're going to work their way into the beds of those Israelite men. And those men, they're weak men, start worshiping your gods, assimilating into your culture. Before you know it, Problem solved. Problem solved. 
You see, he references that story very intentionally. He says, this is how your adversary works. If he can't get you from the top down, he'll get you from the bottom up. If he can't come in the front door, he's gonna break in through the back door of your confession. Um, C.S. Lewis, he puts it this way. C.S. Lewis, this towering giant of an intellect, author, um, he writes a book called The Screwtape Letters. Many of you are familiar with it. One of his most profound works, in my opinion. And C.S. Lewis, he writes this work of fiction called The Screwtape Letters, where it's basically recounting correspondence between a, like a senior level demon and a demon who's just getting started. Entry level demon. Cubicle demon, okay? Um, apprentice, right? In training. And he's writing letters telling him how to tempt Christians, how to derail their confession. And he says this, this is profound. He says, never forget, this is now the demon writing to another demon, never forget when we are dealing with any pleasure in its healthy and normal and satisfying form, we are in a sense on God's ground. I know we've won many souls through pleasure, all the same, pleasure is God's invention, not ours. He made the pleasures. This is fantastic. All our research so far has not enabled us, the demons, to produce a single one. All we can do is to encourage the humans to take the pleasures which God has produced, but take them at times, or in ways, or in degrees, which he has forbidden. Hence, we always try to work away from the natural condition of any pleasure to that in which it is least natural, least reminiscent of its maker, and therefore least pleasurable. An ever-increasing craving for an ever-diminishing pleasure is the formula. To get the man's soul, but give him nothing in return. This is what really gladdens our Father's heart. It's profound profoundly put by Lewis. But you see, this is exactly why Jesus can commend them in verse 13. Hey, you've dwelled at Satan's very throne. You're in the pressure cooker. You've maintained your confession. But in the very next breath, rebuke them. But I have a few things against you. Are there habits? Are there devices? Are there appetites, behaviors, priorities that you're tolerating that don't line up with your confession. In other words, you've been good at guarding the gospel with your mouth, but does your life, the culture of your life, the culture of your church, does it match? Does it match? And I gotta be honest, this was a hard text for me this week as I was studying. It's a hard text because it forces us to ask those hard questions. It forces us to do that soul searching. It forces us to ask such things like, where are we currently compromising on our convictions? Where? What, what portions of our hearts, to use a great phrase, what portions of our hearts still remain unevangelized? What part of our lives, what part of my life, there's plenty, I assure you, what part of my life have I refused or been stubborn to submit to the Lordship of Christ? And that's true for our church as well. Where is, where is our church's priorities askew? Where are the habits we maybe encourage off base? Those are the hard questions. But again, before we, before we despair, I can't close in prayer and let us leave now, right? Before we despair, you see, we're to see though, as we keep reading, that we're able to ask those questions. We're able to ask those really difficult, soul-searching questions within the present and the future hope that we're given by Jesus. Within the present and the future hope that we're given by Jesus. Look at verse 17 now. Look at verse 17. It says, he who has an ear, let him hear. The Spirit says to the churches, to the one who conquers, I will give some of the hidden manna, and I will give him a white stone with a new name. You see, the Jesus who calls Pergamum, 
to complete and exclusive faithfulness. The Jesus who calls them to hand over every portion of their lives to his lordship is the same Jesus who also asked that of Israel in the Old Testament. And you see, as they were journeying to the promised land, and they're tempted, and they're tried from every side, and they're fumbling, and they're stumbling their way there, how did God deal with them? How did God work with them? We're reminded here that he showed his faithfulness to them, literally daily, by raining down bread from heaven. He showed himself faithful even in the midst of their faithlessness, even in the midst of their ups and downs, roller coaster, bumps along the road. He showed his graciousness, his generosity, his faithfulness by literally raining bread, manna, down from heaven and providing for them every single day. You see, I'm, I'm impressed, maybe you are as well, I'm impressed by um, like one of my favorite burger places here has a daily burger. And I find that so impressive. Like every day, it's a new topping, a new meat. I guess if you're going seven days a week, you might eventually catch on. They're probably recycling them at some point. But for me, I go there every time. A daily burger, again? It's fantastic. I love it, right? Uh, think about this now, right? Daily provision by God, raining bread from heaven. I mean, it's cloudy with a chance of meatballs, but the inspired version, right? I mean, it's daily, manna, bread from heaven. And you see, he shows his faithfulness to them in that way. And it demonstrated to Israel, and it demonstrates to us, because we can look at our own lives at God's daily provision. We can look at this church and see God's daily, seasonal, year after year, gracious provision. And it's a reminder then that when God asks for our obedience, when he asks for our faithfulness, when he asks for our submission, or if he asks even for us to sacrifice something, something we love, or, or to give up something that we, that we cherish, but we know he's more satisfying, or to give up something we know is killing us, but we, just, we have such a hard time doing it. When he asks those things of us, we begin to realize then through this illustration here in Revelation, that the God who is asking that of us is not doing so as a dictator or as a tyrant, or you're trying to coerce our obedience. No, he's already proven himself so generous, so gracious, so giving and providing and loving, that if he asks for a corner of our lives that we're just holding on to stubbornly, if he asks for that as well, it must only be for our good. It must only be for our good. And so John reminds us that for those of us who persevere, for those of us who press forward in this life, we will be given, it says, some of the hidden manna, like Israel was in the wilderness. And you see, as Christians, we've already been given a greater manna. We've been given the greater manna, Christ Jesus, the true bread from heaven, whose body and blood is our salvation, and whose same body and blood, that same gospel, is also our sanctification. It will also bring us all the way home. It'll bring us to the finish line. And you see, that's how this passage then ends. We learn of our present hope, daily provision, daily grace, daily generosity on the part of God. But then we also see our future hope. Our future hope. He says, I will give him, I will give us, I will give to you, this is now verse 17 still, a white stone with a new name written on the stone that no one knows except the one who receives it. Scholars debate over what exactly is John referring to here? The white stone. There's much, much debate. You can read commentaries and see a bunch of different possibilities. But one thing that's likely, one image that, that John likely has in his mind, is at the end of these Greco-Roman athletic competitions, the victor is given a stone. Think of it as like a first century trophy, right? They're given a stone with their name emblazoned on it as a victor. And it's that stone with their name emblazoned on it that grants them access to the victor's dinner, 
to the reception where they are crowned, where they are celebrated, where they are rewarded. And you see, this is what God says is true of us as well. Through the gospel, we've been given the white stone. We've been given the victor's ticket, access. And you see, it's not as if Jesus is trying to dangle it like a carrot and say, if you're good enough, this is what you'll get. No, it's supposed to, to, by comparison, shape our appetites, shape our desires. It's supposed to get us to see why would we settle for anything less? Why would we settle for fleeting earthly desires, fleeting earthly passions, when the true heavenly reward awaits us? It's supposed to, by comparison, overwhelm whatever it is that might in the moment be tempting us to turn from the lordship of Christ. You've been given the white stone with a new name, the victor's stone, access to the dinner, access to the party. That's what you're made for. Why would you settle for anything less? Why would I settle for anything less? C.S. Lewis, again, uh, in another work of his, he puts it this way, and you've heard it before, I've actually shared it before in other sermons, but he puts it so profoundly, I have to repeat it here. He says this, indeed, if we consider the unblushing promises of reward and the staggering nature of the rewards promised to us in the Gospels, it would seem our Lord finds our desires not too strong, but too weak. We are half-hearted creatures, fooling about with drink and sex and ambition when infinite joy is offered us. Like an ignorant child who wants to go on making mud pies in a slum because he cannot imagine what is meant by an offer of a holiday at the sea, we are far too easily pleased. Far too easily pleased. You see, Pergamum, and I would argue us as well, they needed to be reminded that we call on Jesus as Savior on the wrath for sin that is to come. But we also call on him as Lord. And sometimes his lordship, it asks much of us. It asks us to stand up for things that are right. It asks us to call out things that are wrong. It asks us to sometimes make sacrifices and give up things in our lives for the greater good of Christ and his church and his kingdom. And you see, Pergamum needed to be reminded of that. And I think we do as well. That we're called to exchange our earthly pursuits for heavenly. And in those moments where we're tempted to, to falter, our encouragement is that banquet that is to come. The eternal wedding supper of the Lamb, where you have a seat already reserved because of what Christ has done. You have a ticket that's been punched. You have a white stone with your name on it. That's our destiny. That's where we're headed. That's a glorious thought. It's a glorious thought. I'll end um, with this. Bam Adebayo. Ring a bell? Bam Adebayo. I see a couple of heads nodding. Bam Adebayo was the uh, most recent draft pick by the Miami Heat. All right, and so uh, National Basketball Association this past week had their draft. Bam Adebayo all right, goes 14th, 14th pick in the NBA draft to the Miami Heat. And if you're not familiar, Bam Adebayo is this 6'10", 245 pound, um, just finished his freshman year at Kentucky. Okay? Forward, center, 6'10", 245, 5% body fat. Awesome. All right? I was a Heat fan, excited. All right? Uh, and he just finished his freshman year, like I said, at the University of Kentucky. Gets drafted. But if you know his story, and this was written in the Palm Beach Post, if you know his story, uh, originally from New Jersey, moves when he's young, with just he and his mom, they move to, to North Carolina, and they're trying to eke out an existence, living in the single wide trailer, just trying to make it work. But thankfully, Bam has basketball, and he has immense physical giftings. 
and basketball he finds success in. Actually, he's a late bloomer, doesn't really start till high school, but eventually catches on quick. Is successful in high school, gets a scholarship, University of Kentucky, one of the top basketball programs in the country. But as he's entering into his freshman dorm, his, one of his AAU high school coaches comes to visit him. And he visits him, and he brings him a picture. And he brings him a framed picture, and it's that single wide trailer in North Carolina. And it's, uh, there's a plaque on the bottom, and it says, never forget where you came from, but never lose sight of where you're going. Never forget where you came from, never lose sight of where you're going. And it hung on his wall in the dorm for that year prior to him being drafted by the Miami Heat. You see Pergamum, the Church of Pergamum, and I think us here at Coral Ridge, we always need to be reminded of where we come from. We've been purchased, we've been bought, we've been saved by the blood of Christ Jesus, our Lord. But Pergamum and us too, we live in this broken world. And this earthly life can sometimes tempt us, it can sometimes try us, it can sometimes derail us, and it can sometimes make us lose sight of just where it is we're going, just what it is that we're destined for. And it's in that moment where the gospel reminds us and it empowers us and it motivates us to increasingly put away the things of this world, put away the earthly priorities and pursuits and pursue the heavenly ones that are to come, which is our destiny with Jesus Christ at the great wedding feast of the Lamb. May that be our hope. May that be what empowers us as we go forward.